So ever since Descartes, scientists and philosophers uh, have tried to figure out how this entity, this thinking thing, interacts with the body, the other thing. And the big yes. breakthrough in system science, and this goes back to Maturana and Varela is, and to Gregory Bateson, is mm -hmm. to recognize that the mind is not a thing but a process. This is now uh, called cognition, the process of knowing, and it is closely associated with the self-organization of those living networks. So the very process of self-organization is a cognitive process, and that is a huge, uh, very revolutionary yes. breakthrough. That is. I very much appreciated that in your work here, where... The notion, and maybe you could talk about this, uh, the notion of consciousness, which is otherwise considered utterly massive in its importance, is virtually, if I understand correctly, a subset of cognitive function. That's, that's right. This, this uh, concept of cognition, which goes back to as I said, Gregory Bateson and Umberto Maturana, who discovered yes. it independently in, in the late uh, 1960s. Uh, this, this concept sees cognition, the process of knowing, as an essential process of all life. So even a bacterium, even a simple cell, uh, perceives things in the environment, bonds according to the sensory perception, uh, and uh, this is seen as a cognitive activity. And as uh, organisms become more and more complex in the history of evolution, the processes of cognition that are always associated with the biological structures also become more and more complex. And we get the evolution of a nervous system, the evolution of a brain. And at a certain stage of evolution then, something new emerges and that is self-awareness, to be aware not only of the environment, but of oneself, not only to know, but also to know that, that we know. And that is what, what is called consciousness. And consciousness actually is used in, in many different ways, in different traditions yes. and by different people. But this, is, this kind of reflective kind of consciousness is uh, mm -hmm. what, what I call uh, when I, consciousness when I use the term. So it is a special type of cognition, a special cognitive process of a certain complexity which emerged in, in the great apes and then the hominids and humans in evolution. You know, I want to bring this up because I, I remember you're mentioning that in something I, I was watching of yours. And we know today, first of all, one of the things you keep kind of up bringing forward in the way you speak is this, this relationship between our intuitive knowing and our conscious, analytical, scientific inquiry. Right. And you have been, I don't have to say masterful, in articulating the scientific aspect of our in collective intuitive knowing. I don't mean everyone, but many people who have taken the time to be reflective about the nature of life, the nature of mm -hmm. reality, the nature of perception. So from this point of view, we, even scientifically, we know from books such as The Secret Life of Plants, and much research has been done since then about the communication between humans and trees and plants, and even Gaia as an intelligence herself, and the native peoples, the indigenous people from all over the world, are highly expressive of this deep abiding exactly. relationship. Exactly. How does that figure into what you're putting forward? Yeah. Well, first of all, let's start with the last point that indigenous cultures, Native American cultures, for instance, when they talk mm -hmm. about nature, when they talk about the plants and animals in our environment, they call them their relations. 
right? All my yes. relations. All That's my a relations. very, very well-known uh, expression. Right. Well, they're mm. right. They are, they are literally right because ever since Darwin, we know that all living species have a common ancestor. And since we all have a common ancestor, we are all related. And, and it's completely true that, that the tree outside my study here and, and you know, uh, my cat and, and uh, the, the yeah. deer that goes by our garden, you know, these, these are my relations, literally, yeah. you know, in the sense of evolution. Now, I want to say something also about intuition, and this is something I realized over the years as I was uh, investigating nonlinear systems. To me, intuitive knowledge is the knowledge of a nonlinear phenomenon, because nonlinearity is something that we cannot uh, completely analyze in language and in rational thought which are linear, but yeah. we can recognize them intuitively. Let me give you an, an example that I often use in, in my classes, and I also use it in my online course uh, when, mm -hmm. when I talk to my students. Suppose uh, you, you, you have a, a good friend, and she walks into the room one day, or you meet in a cafe, and you say, what's the matter with you? Uh, why are you so sad? Now, how do you know that she is sad? If I ask you, how do you know? You won't be able to tell me. You, you just say, well, I just, she looks sad. Well, how does she look sad? Well, there are dozens and hundreds of facial expressions of mm -hmm. the tone of her voice, of the way she holds herself, it, and it all combines into a nonlinear pattern which translates into sadness. And the intuitive mind picks that up. So intuition is the sudden recognition of a nonlinear pattern. And if you want to analyze and describe it, you can do it, but it's always imperfect. It's never as perfect as, yeah. as the flash of intuition. So that, to me, is what intuition is. Beautiful. I like that. It's, uh, it's the combination of what might be a thousand or 10,000 bits of information exactly. of micro movements. And it's yeah. as though, right, we have a, um, an antenna, which, yeah. and in fact, we do. It's called the nervous system. Yeah. And, and our perceptual apparatus, right? Yeah. Is and this is precisely what those psychologists in the 1920s and 30s called a gestalt. A gestalt exactly. for them is a, a perceptual and nonlinear perceptual pattern, and it takes intuition to perceive it. Yes, exactly. And you're right. We can linearize it if we want to. It would be very tedious. <laughs> but it's almost like you take the old movies where Nickelodeon, where you would go frame by frame, yes, and the yes, faster you yes. turn, the, it becomes continuous. Right. Well, of course, the Buddhists believe that's actually all reality. is just yeah. occurring in flashes anyway. And yeah. we're the ones, through our perceptual yeah. uh, framework and mindset, connect all of those dots yeah. and turn it into a sequence. Yeah. That we call and you, our see, lives. Um, right. you see, in science, we, we were helped enormously in the last uh, 20, 30 years by this development of a nonlinear mathematics with the help of computers. Mm -hmm. We can now yeah. analyze things nonlinearly. And uh, when you solve a nonlinear equation with these new techniques, what you get is not a formula like the equations we, we used to solve in high school, but uh, you get a pattern, you get a holistic pattern, and the strange attractors of chaos theory yeah. or the fractals of fractal geometry are those patterns. Sure. You program the computer to draw out this pattern, and the pattern is a uh, representation of the dynamics of an entire system. Fascinating. And now they have quantum computers. I can't even yeah, begin I mean, this to is, imagine... Uh, yeah. what that is what yeah is i don't even want to start <laughs> talking about oh this. okay <laughs> that's a whole other thing but i yeah. i do want to bring up before we part 
the uh, deep relationship you have with Gaia, with Mother Earth, which has shown up in much of your work. And while some of it is articulated explicitly, it is always implicit. There we go with intuition again. And reading yeah, thank the you. Lines. And, uh, and sure. also, you know, this it comes through also when I teach. You know, I've, I've been teaching yes. uh, my whole professional life, and now I have embarked on a new venture, which is, as you mentioned, uh, my online course, uh, yes. which uh, I call tell us Cap- about that. So people yeah, it's, can. Uh, I tune call in it. Ca- they wish. I call it Capra course, just uh, so that people can easily find it on the internet and recognize it. And yes. it is it is based on the system three of life, based on the textbook, and it consists of twelve pre-recorded lectures that were recorded in a very beautiful environment in the living room of an architect, a friend of mine, uh, with with a lot of art, a lot of symbolic decorations, and so on, with a small audience of ten to fifteen people. So each lecture is about forty minutes. And each lecture is available or is, is presented uh, for one week. And the past lectures remain available, but each week you get a new lecture. And in mm-hmm. addition to that, we have an online discussion forum in which I participate regularly. So every day mm-hmm. I interact with my students, with the course participants, in, you know, by posting things online. And I must tell you, Mitchell, I really enjoy that. And it is quite different from a classroom Uh, Of course, you don't have the direct face-to-face contact, but what you have is a discussion that is much more substantial because when somebody asks me a question, I don't need to answer right away. You know, it's posted, and I can mull it over. I can look up some mm. books. I can I can look up yeah. something on you know on the internet, and then answer in a much more complete way. And on the student side, in order to ask a question or make a comment, you also you don't have to do it right away. You can really think it over. And so the the discussion we have, and it's a whole network of of discussions. Uh, the discussion is much more substantial than in the classroom. And I, I must say I really enjoy that. I spend about half an hour a day when the course runs, spend about mm-hmm. 30 minutes a day interacting with my students, and I really enjoy it. Well, that is wonderful to hear, Rodolf, because I will be one of your students. Well, Hazel and I will be sharing a seat together. <laughs> your ex- course. Exactly. So for, for uh, our listeners, there is a very extensive yeah. website uh, at capracourse.net where you can find all the details. Fantastic. There is one more quintessential question that I have to ask you. Because sure. of this deep relationship you have with systems, natural systems, and clearly your love of the earth, planet, and, and life itself, And that is, we are talking about disruptions and disturbances and precipices of the social institutions we have, political, economic, etc., as well as ecological. And it looks like we are facing a phenomenon, Fritoff, of immeasurable, incalculable importance. And we refer to it as climate change. I don't care, right. actually, about the phrase. But we do observe phenomena, such as the severe melting of ice caps, both north and south. We see the uh, sea levels rising. We see a warming of the planet, by and large, to severe degrees. We see fires happening in places they didn't happen, tornadoes and hurricanes happening in places they typically haven't. We know the Earth is always part of a cycle. However, it also (laughs) seems very obvious that uh, the anthropogenic aspect of all of this is staring at us in the face. What are your thoughts about what is happening and where we're going and what's before us? Well, uh, first of all, let me come back to the fact that all these uh, phenomena and all these severe problems 
you mentioned are interconnected and interdependent and we yes. need systemic solutions to solve them. Now, the good news is that we have these systemic solutions. In, in our textbook, we spend about 60 pages at the end discussing the most important systemic solutions to all these problems, to the energy problem, climate change, uh, economic inequality, violence and war. All these problems have solutions which have been designed and tested around the world, mostly by NGOs, by the global civil society. The problem is that the corporate world and the political world has invested a lot in the status quo and doesn't want to change things. Think, for example, of the fossil fuel companies. They don't want to shift to wind energy or solar energy. We know how to do it. We have the technologies. We have the knowledge. Oh, sure. What we need is the political will and uh, you know, the values. It becomes a question of values and ethics. So that's, that's one thing I want to say. The other thing which is also very serious, and, and you ask this question, where are we going? And to formulate yeah. it in another way, you could, to make it more dramatic, you could say, is there hope for the future? Are we going to make it? Are we going to save the world? And I, I deliberately want say, didn't want to set up that drama, but well, please go on. Uh, I appreciate I, it. I think you know this is you know our listeners will will think along those lines, and I can yeah. tell you that I have been very inspired over the last ten years or so by the writings of Václav Havel, the great Czech playwright and former president of the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm who mm -hmm. wrote in one of his books, uh, who, who asked this question, is there hope for the future? And he turns it into a meditation on hope itself. And uh, mm -hmm. if you look at, at our book, The System's View of Life, this is how we end the book, with this quotation by Havel on the very last page of the book. And let me read it to you. This is what Václav Havel writes. The kind of hope that I often think about, I understand above all as a state of mind, not a state of the world. Either we have hope within us or we don't. It is a dimension of the soul, and it's not essentially dependent on some particular observation of the world or estimate of the situation. Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. So this is, has been my inspiration over all oh, these years. God, I understand, Fischer. That is very powerful. It takes it out of one realm and leaves it deeply on the level of soul. Of spirituality, and essentially. Yes. And spirituality, exactly. Well, I think that is an utterly beautiful note to... Uh, complete this interview on and I just uh, can't thank you enough for the good work right. that you have been well, doing. Well thank you, this has been a real pleasure to talk to you.